And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to our first speaker today, Allegra Burnett. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I guess good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are joining us from uh, today. Um, I am very pleased to welcome you all to the, our very first uh, MCN Pro Workshop. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Allegra Burnett. I'm the Creative Director of Digital Media at the Museum of Mart, Modern Art, and I'm the current president of the Museum Computer Network. And for those of you who may be more unfamiliar with MCN, the organization was founded in 1967, which is over 40 years ago. Uh, and in fact, we just had our 40th con conference last month in Seattle. So if you imagine what computers were like in museums in 1967, you can realize how incredible it is that the organization was founded that long ago. Um, and as our mission states, the Museum Computer Network, MCN, supports the greater museum community by providing continuing opportunities to explore, implement, and disseminate new technologies and best practices in the field. And so that's exactly why we started this MCN Pro Series. We wanted to be able to provide practical resources to you that went beyond the annual conference. Um, these workshops would not be possible without my predecessor, Christina DePaolo, uh, who, as the president of MCN last year, worked with MCN's manager, Eric Longo, the MCN board, and Learning Times to launch this partnership. I'm very excited to be here to introduce the first event, which is the fruit of that labor. So we have a great lineup for you today. Um, our workshop features David Hart from the Museum of Modern Art, Emily Lytle Painter from the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and our moderator today is Neil Stimler from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Before we get underway, I'd like to quickly introduce each of them. Neil Stimler is an Associate Digital Asset Specialist in the Digital Media Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Say that five times fast. Um, in addition to his work in digital humanities, which has included lectures at various conferences and an article in Curator Journal, Neil organized the first outsourced, uh, crowdsourced uh, YouTube panel, Philosophical Leadership Needed for the Future, Digital Humanities Scholars and Museums, which was for the 2011 Museum Computer Network Conference. Neil, by the way, is also MCN's twit Twitter extraordinaire. Um, David Hart is a media producer here at the, in the digital media department at MoMA, where he focuses on educational resources and video. He holds a master's in art and art education from Teachers College at Columbia University and is a visiting instructor at Pratt Institute. Having had the distinct pleasure to work with David for more than six years now, I can say in all honesty that he's actually three people in one. Uh, he has built MoMA's online video program up from pretty much nothing to now hundreds of hours of material available through numerous channels, including live streaming, YouTube, and iTunes U. And finally, uh, Emily Lytle Painter is the media project coordinator for publishing and media at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. She manages digital and online content for the museum, including Art Babble, which is an art video website with over 35 international par partner institutions. Art Babel uh, just relaunched with a new redesign. Uh, if you haven't already checked it out, be sure to spend some time with it after this session. Uh, Emily also manages the creation of mobile multimedia tours for the museum's special exhibitions and the IMA's many award-winning video projects. And in January, Emily will start a new role at the Getty as educational technologist. Now, before I turn things over to Neil, I wanted to remind you that the next workshop will take place on February 5th and will focus on e-publishing. We'll be announcing the topics for the next three in the series very shortly. I hope you'll join us for all of them and give us feedback along the way so that we can make these workshops as an effective a resource for you as possible. I should also note another resource, uh, which is MCN's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash museumcn. The channel currently has some material from past conferences and will soon have video from this year's conference added as well. So I think without further ado, I will turn things over to Neil. Neil? Take it away. Thank you, Allegra. Good morning, everyone. Greetings. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, we've had a few polls up just to kind of get a sense of, of your experience with video so far, your institution or your interests. We have a few more polls that we'd like to throw up just before we get started with kind of the overall framework of the workshop to get a better understanding for our presenters and also for you to see where people are with their different video production areas. Great. And Neil, as we bring those up, I, I noticed we had a quick clarification that came in on the uh, on one of our questions here. Yes. Would you be able to let us know if by video production you're referring just to recording and editing or general commissioning activity? That's a good question. I don't think we distinguish that when thinking about the polls, but uh, Matt, if you have uh, 
further ideas on that, please continue to talk about it in the chat, and we'll try to answer your question there. Great, and we're just pulling up a couple more polls here. Great. So the polls, the polls that you're seeing uh, right now were put together by, after conversation amongst the, the presenters. We realized that different institutions, different folks have a variety of different levels of video production. Could be very high end, could be very rough and, rough and cut. Um, and we just wanted to get a sense too of where are people in the video landscape now and what are they doing? Looks like we've got a pretty interesting split here with some of the typical video projects. Very interesting. Thank you all for contributing to the polls. We're going to, we're going to keep these uh, the data from these polls to look back on at the conference and and uh, be able to kind of share that with people as well. Great. Looks like we're about set with those. And uh, I think we have maybe one or two more. Definitely. And you'll see those first few polls launching. Uh, or the, these next couple, sorry, launching on the screen in a moment. One of them is going to be an interactive poll that we have on the main screen, but we'd also like you to answer a question in the chat box for us. Uh, we're wondering what topics, uh, oh, and hold on one second, let me just pull this one up and we'll launch that momentarily. Looks I, like YouTube for folks when they're applying on YouTube is a big place for video distribution, which is uh, really great to see. That's, that's why Museum CN, MCN has a YouTube channel as well. We felt that was a really important way to share the video experience with people. Great. Somewhat with Vimeo. And just to point out to everyone, you can click on multiple options here if you do use yes, more than too. one. You, you, could be, you could be distributing video through multiple channels. Um, sometimes your institutional channel can be connected to, our, to uh, YouTube or Babel or Vimeo. So you can actually select multiple of choices here. And I just added a question in the chat box on the left, and we'd love to get your responses there for this one. Uh, what topic is most important for you to learn about in this workshop? And if you can let us know your thoughts there, that would be great. Thank you, Adam. Great. Okay, I think we've got the consensus there on that poll. So that's, that's the end of the polls, correct, Adam? Uh, that is correct. Okay, great. So I think we can clear those polls off. Thank you all for participating in those, and please do continue to talk to us on the chat and uh, through Twitter. And uh, I'm really happy to welcome you to the workshop again today, this morning, and uh, going to give you kind of some high-level things to think about as we get into David and Emily's conversations and presentations. Just thinking about video in digital culture. And you can follow me at Neil Stimler on Twitter. So the first thing we want to think about is that video in digital culture, I would say, is expression en masse, and that we are all part of a creator's collective, tapping into the world with our eyes and hands and making a sharing aesthetic understandings. Expression in digital culture with video is hyperdynamic, with mobility, speed, and the transmutational power that the digital brings to everyday life. We're seemingly in a constant flux, between a sense of truth with an instant viral video and the filtered lens, a documentary metamorphosis. Video in digital culture is also an asset. Video infinitely springs forth from a still frame to motion, animation and reanimation. It gives us the ability to play back life itself. Video is of the moment of its creation and becomes the enduring legacy of cultural memory. It is both timely and timeless. With video, much of what has been captured will be lost, a fragile and impermanent nature. How do we encode culture for the future? And video and digital culture is also content. The density of video presents substantial amounts of sensory material to cohere through layers of meaning. But although dense, one can still digest the complexity of expression and form channeled through video into its essences. Video is impactful and resonant in a digital culture as we buffer life together bit by bit 
streaming into each other. And video's relationship to museums and digital culture is one of kinship through musing, seeing, and making meaning. So those are the kind of the overall ideas that I wanted to share with you this morning before we launch into David and Emily's presentations as they get into more of their specific content. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. So I'll turn it over to David. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for coming. It's very exciting to see all the different uh, museums that are popping up. Um, I saw somebody from the old Idaho Penitentiary Museum, which uh, I just remembered I went to when I was three years old. So it's very exciting to see such a wide variety. And it was also very interesting to see the results for me of the different um, poll results that we saw so that we have a nice spread of different experiences. And we're uh, taking note of all of the questions that were coming up as far as most important questions people have. And what we're going to do is I will do a brief introduction as to what we do uh, normally at MoMA and some musings on what we do. And Emily will then talk about um, everything from her perspective. And then we're going to have a larger discussion about some other topics. So if there's something that Emily or I have not covered by the time we're done with our presentations, um, don't worry. You're going to see plenty of us for the next little while. So uh, I wanted to start first by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, my background is that I'm from Los Angeles. My mother, before she was married, was part of this collective of nuns uh, called the Immaculate Heart of Mary that are uh, nuns that were affiliated with the artist sister, Corita Kent. Um, and so for them, art in general had a very social meaning to it. It was something that was not just to be put up on a wall. It was something where you were out in the street carrying it around making music and uh, trying to share the information with people around you. So why do I mention that? What does this have to do with actually creating video? So the reason why I mention it is that everybody in the end, your end viewers, have their own biases. They have uh, what I like to think of as sort of circles of filters that you have to work through as a producer. So they have their own filters of what it is they're interested in. They have these filters of uh, why they want to listen to something. They have filters of where they are. And your real challenge as a producer is to get to know them as much as possible and to build some sort of relationship so you can figure out what it is that they're interested in, and then be able to provide content that sort of matches up to that. So as somebody has these biases uh, of content, these biases of content delivery, these biases of when they want to look at something, they then figure out how much attention to give to you as a broadcaster. So the real challenge is that you as a producing organization have to somehow figure out a way through this vast network and then get to that individual person. Um, couple that with the fact that the internet is massively growing, everybody's producing content, and your museum, somehow MoMA's on here twice, uh, your museum may just be a little speck on that spectrum, but all of the other museums that are featured here and everyone that's in the chat is in sort of the same predicament that um, people don't necessarily go to museums on the internet for content. They go to, you know, the cats, they go to TED Talks, they go to Netflix. And so we really need to figure out some way to distinguish ourselves in this environment. And that's kind of the challenge that we're facing as producers. The nice thing about it is that these biases that people have for content, for where they want to watch something, and for how much attention they want to give to it are actually the three things that you as a video producer can impact. You have the ability to set the tone. You have the ability to drive different types of formats for your videos and put them out in different places so that people have a wider range to be able to reach your content. And you have control over the duration. There's nobody telling you that you necessarily have to make one minute videos. There's nobody telling you that you can't make an entire movie. And there's also nobody telling you that you have to make a movie and not just a one minute video. It goes down to what it is you're trying to tell, the story it is you're trying to share, and figuring out the best possible way to do that. So all of that adds up to having a strategy. And given from our experience over the last six years or so, I can tell you that a strategy is a lot more than just making 
45 time-lapse videos, uh, which I don't think we've made that many, but we're getting to that point. Um, it, of course, is okay to start from a place of not necessarily knowing where you're going to end up. And I encourage a lot of museums that are just starting out to go ahead and take that time to experiment with different formats, experiment with different ways of working, trying to figure out if maybe the best way to tell their story is to uh, live stream presentations that are already being done in their public uh, facilities, or if maybe the best way to do that is to have video cameras set up in the galleries where visitors can ask questions, um, maybe it's to talk to their educators, maybe it's to talk to their curators. You have to really just try things out and see what sticks. Um, I also like this quote because it's one from uh, Merlin Mann. Merlin is sort of an internet philosopher, uh, but I also mention him because a good example of one of the more unusual type of video projects we did is in conjunction with our film department, they found a series of um, older, stranger, silent films. We then invited a group of comedians to make short videos in response to those films, and then we showed those all in a public um, forum. So it's a little bit of a different way to think of it. It doesn't necessarily have to be something where it's just a talking head and you just plop it up on the internet and don't do anything else around it. It can be a very open-ended medium, and it's something that you really can experiment with. So let me tell you a little bit about video at MoMA. It's always weird to use the word video at MoMA because we have a collection of video content uh, produced by professional artists, and then we have the video that we put up online. So I always like to say that we're a little bit more like Bob Ross and less like Bill Viola. And that's also, I think, a good learning curve is trying to find producers who can work with you that understand that they aren't necessarily making a piece of art themselves. When they're making a video with you, they are there to support the mission of your museum and to try to figure out some way to let that story shine. Um, and if you have a very good video producer, they'll get that. So let me walk you through some of the types of videos that we normally do. We normally have some videos that support exhibitions within the installation. So for example, this is an exhibition that was done in the architecture and design program. Um, the very exciting thing about working with architects is that they're used to doing schematics and video mock-ups and those types of things. So a lot of times they're coming with their own content already made. Um, and I think this is the case we're going to see in the next five to ten years is a lot of artists are going to start taking their own reins and taking their own cues and making their own video content for you to be able to repurpose. And that's kind of the ideal situation. So in this case, the architects created their own videos. We then created some um, videos that were in support. Oh, there it is. Uh, in support of what they were saying by interviewing them and then put those uh, in the installation itself. There also are cases where there is an unusual piece on display. So for example, this was a um, temporary exhibition uh, and this was a piece that is a special artwork for making prints uh, using the printer's breath. And so we had a video of him doing a demonstration that was on the wall. So visitors, as they were looking at this object, could then uh, find out a little bit more about the object by looking at that video. There's also more unusual things that we do that are uh, like the flux kit that was used in conjunction with the Fluxus show that was up recently. The curator had a very interesting idea um, to invite artists to intervene with the flux kit, and then we produced videos in conjunction with the artists. So some um, artists, uh, like Allison Knowles, we just did a straight-up interview. That's what she was interested in doing. Some artists, uh, like Popel, ended up making a video where he pretended to steal the flux kit and take it outside of the museum. So it was a very uh, fun day to shoot that type of content. Um, and I should say before I get too far that there are definitely things that we shoot by ourselves. There are definitely things that we bring in crews for. There are things that we edit by ourselves, and there are things that we send out to get edited. It's really just a matter of what makes the most sense for the project that we're working on and our schedule. We do a lot of installation videos, so um, this shot is the uh, Cindy Sherman show, the wallpaper that was designed by Cindy Sherman for the installation. We did a time-lapse video, and I'm chuckling because I was just up there an hour ago setting up another uh, time-lapse for that same space for 
another set of wallpaper that would be going up. And that's something that was then put out online and wasn't necessarily there for people to view um, in C2. In conjunction with that exhibition uh, for the Cindy Sherman Show, the curator wanted to interview different uh, people surrounding Cindy's artwork um, because Art21 had done a really good segment with Cindy. And so we wanted to have something that built out the story um, beyond that segment. And we didn't want to necessarily repeat what Art21 had done really well. So in this case, we had interviews with different artists, um, her uh, gallery rep, uh, some artists that had worked with her in the past, some historians that were influenced by her work, and these videos were made available in the museum using a QR code that people could then scan and uh, watch the video. We were then releasing those out online for people to be able to watch. Um, QR codes I would not entirely recommend, but I think there are good uses for them. Um, it's just a very tricky technology to use. Um, the very nice thing, or, or what I enjoyed about working on this project, was the fact that this show is now traveling, and as it's traveled, we've been able to pass those videos along to each institution that has hosted the show. And so now it's got this longer um, span. The content is out there and being shared with more audiences. And I think that this is um, indicative of a trend you're seeing with a lot of museums where people are starting to realize that somebody else has produced something that's good. I don't need to reinvent the wheel, and we can kind of work through that process together. Um, it's a very uh, great way for us to share resources, and it actually um, we got the idea a lot from working with SF MoMA in the past on some of our uh, former shows. Uh, I think there's a question in the Q&A a Q &A from um, William Wagner about QR codes. QR codes in general, I think, are a um, good technology if done well, but it's one of those technologies where you have to then explain to people often what the technology is in order for them to get to the content. So it's as this extra barrier um, in order for people to get to the content. If so. If there's some way to preload the content on a device or put it on the screen or take away that additional step. Um, I advise that. I think the other issue we had that we did not necessarily think of in this case was that it was a show where there was no photography allowed. And so I think the security guards were a little bit uh, nervous about people taking their phone out and scanning the QR codes. But um, I think it's, I I'm very honest about the fact that we, it's a continual learning process for us. So as we keep working through things, um, they continue to teach us things and we keep doing more research around uh, best uses. We also do a large amount of educational content. Um, our education department has worked vigorously to build uh, content that has a longer span above and beyond just the special exhibition. And this is something that I think Emily is going to hit on uh, very well also in her talk, but the type of resources that you have on staff from educators to conservators uh, really do help build out your story a little bit more and it's not necessarily something where you just need to build a marketing piece or something for a special exhibition. So to give you one example, we did a video for um, F111 being on display it was then distributed in a variety of channels. So it was used on our exhibition site. It was used on MoMA.org in our multimedia player. It was then featured in a blog post on our blog. It was distributed out to iTunes U for feed there. It was distributed in Art Babel, and you can see the older Art Babel there, and it's uh, looking really nice and fresh now with the new upload that was just done. And it was placed out on our YouTube channel. So we try to spread things out as much as possible, and we try to kind of pollinate as many different networks because we know that there are viewing preferences, and some people will go on YouTube, and some people won't go on YouTube, and some people want to download things to iTunes U, and some people don't. So it's one of those things of, the wider spread you can get, the better in most cases. We've also been doing a large amount of experimentation with live streaming, um, which sort of started with the Marina Abramovich, uh, the Artist is Present exhibition, where there was a, a call to install a webcam um, that had no audio to stream while people were sitting with her. Uh, and that was a very interesting project for us to work on, and I think it, it kind of whetted our appetites for doing other things like that. 
it's also been a very great way for us to share performance within the museum. And the nice thing about it is that the performance can be archived or it cannot be archived. So it gives the artist some comfort as to whether they want to share uh, their whole performance out with the world or if they just want it to be something where people can log in, take a look at it, and then it's there and more ephemeral to sort of um, takes it from there. We've also tried to do some uh, walkthroughs with curators uh, of exhibitions, and that's been a very interesting um, attempt for us. We had a very fun time with the Talk to Me exhibition because we have a number of um, bilingual educators. They were able to do walkthroughs in uh, Spanish and in Japanese and in uh, German, I think, and uh, in English. So we had this nice spread of languages that were um, available to people and, and really helped build a more international audience for the exhibition. Uh, live streaming as a whole, I, I'm happy to talk to anybody about if uh, you ever want to talk about it in detail. Um, it's a very new technology. It's growing up. Um, YouTube recently has partnered pretty um, strongly with Wirecast. Uh, to be able to do some live streaming on their site. And I think you're going to see it really turn from a sense of infancy in the last couple of years to a more uh, robust technology and something that's a little bit easier for people to use off the shelf and then uh, be able to build off of. So I'm always happy to talk to people about that if you ever want to. We also have started to realize that Above and beyond just the general content that we get out into the world, um, we've always thought of it as there's usually three different types of viewers that are interested in content. There's kind of the casual observer, somebody that isn't necessarily part of the museum audience but might be drawn into something that you're working on. There's a more medium level person who probably has some art world knowledge, has some interest in museums, and then we have what we like to um, kind of jokingly refer to as our super fans. So you have people that really want deep, rich content. And I think you're seeing this in other technologies like podcasting, where people are looking for um, something they're interested in and something they're deeply interested in, and they're willing to make a commitment with that. So we have tried a couple different things. The um, first thing that really built out was our online courses. And those are both historical courses as well as studio courses and we're launching some other more thematic courses and the education department has done a fantastic job in making these uh, not only self-guided courses but courses where the instructor is interacting with the uh, students and so you have this kind of generative process of learning that's very exciting and really has opened it up to um, a lot of different people that we would love to serve. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when we first started, we had a very simple video set up for that course, and we got a call from somebody who was on a dial-up connection on an island somewhere and was having trouble doing the download. And so it really pushed us to try to make things more accessible, to try to make them um, as available as possible, and really put as much effort into that. Um, they are pay courses, so there is a fee associated with it. I think that part of that is to make sure that um, we can offer the most uh, strong content. We can offer something where the instructors have put a long uh, amount of time into the work and that it's something where the interaction with the instructor is very rich. So we want to make sure that we're offering that type of experience while we're, we're still offering things to the general public uh, to make sure that that is there. Um, I think there was a question about the uh, expense for live streaming events. Uh, you can do it for free. Um, you can also pay for pro accounts, uh, and it's just a matter of making that decision. And that's something I think we're going to hit on a little bit later um, when we talk about making a decision as far as how to uh, select a platform. So we will be building that out. Um, and I think we also got another couple of questions about Vimeo versus other things, and we'll definitely get to that. The other initiative we've undertaken in the last six months to a year is our Digital Members Lounge. Um, and this is something that we're trying to do in order to help support membership for a lot of people that might not be able to make it physically to the museum. So there are people that want to have access to the exhibitions and access to 
a lot of the uh, content of the museum, but don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to come and visit. And so we're trying to make sure that we're offering something to those people that have made a commitment to the museum. So what we're doing is things like members gallery talks, where we have an educator go through and give a gallery talk of an exhibition or a theme within the collection. We have an interactive set, uh, set of walkthroughs that are uh, we like to say similar to the Google Art Project, but um, we like them a little bit more because it allows us to then offer more content up that uh, rights-wise we might have issues with putting out on Google. So if we put it on our own servers and it's within our own network, I think we're able to offer more content up to people. And we're offering exclusive content when we can in order um, to then give them an additional uh, reason to get out there a little bit more. Um, there was a quick question about reproductions of rights uh, for people in videos. Uh, the ways that we have dealt with it have been um, either having a sign when people enter space. So with a Marina Abramovich um, webcam, there was a sign there that said, as you enter the space, you are giving up rights to be able to photograph, blah, 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 blah. It's a lot like if you go to any theater event now, you'll see that type of language if somebody's entering in. Um, and the big thing that we do is we make sure that any of the presenters then uh, know that the, it's going to be archived and broadcast, and we work with them to make sure that they're okay with that. So there are definitely times when we're able to broadcast things but not archive them or not broadcast that, and we kind of work our way through that. So. Um, all this is to say, you can do everything that I've just talked about also, and you don't necessarily need to be a Scrooge McDuck to do that. And uh, we also are not in that position of having this giant vault. It's something where we have really slowly built up over the last six years. We started with one laptop that had iMovie on it and one off-the-shelf, uh, very inexpensive camera, and we have built up to a more robust, of a video crew. So we're very nimble, we're very agile, and we squeeze what we have to get the most out of it. And we found that a lot of times it's just about finding a partner to work with you. So the real advantage that we have is that we're in New York City, so there are a lot of video producers out there, and a lot of video producers who are hungry to work on very interesting content. Um, we were filming last month with a producer who, when I told her what we would be able to pay her, uh, and how little it was, she said, you know, I've been working on um, large commercial projects for the last six months, and I really need something that I can stick my teeth into that is interesting and exciting for me. So I think it's one of those things where you just sort of work time through that. Um, and to kind of get to a question that is just coming up in the uh, chat now, full-time doing production um, I, we, it's basically a zero. I mean, I'm in the digital media department, but I'm also working on other educational projects. Within our um, education department, we have a part-time contract person who's working on the courses, but is doing the administration of it. So it's a lot of the times it is us shooting things or editing things, or it's us working with a um, camera crew that we trust, that we've worked with repeatedly. In some cases, we have our AV staff on staff that does anything within the museum in the theaters. So if we want to live stream something, we work with them to make sure that we are live streaming when they would normally be doing an archival recording of a performance. And so all they're doing is sending out an extra audio line to us, and we're connecting to the internet. So total staff is uh, zero, dedicated um, to video, but I think it's spread across a lot of departments. You get a little piece here and a little piece there and a little piece there and you end up having uh, enough to get done what you need to get done. So this is the part where I dissuade you gently from getting whole hog into video if you haven't. Um, I like to think of it as a picture is worth a thousand words. A video is a picture every 24 sec uh, frames per second over the time span of your video, so it's millions of words, but an unplayed video is pretty much worthless. So the number one thing is, is it visually compelling? Is there a reason for it to be video? Uh, I know that a lot of people say, well, you know, people like to see the person that's talking. 
Well, in that case, you can take a picture of them and then do an audio recording. Um, video editing itself is extremely time consuming. It is something that is an art and craft on its own and needs to be thought of in that way. So if there are ways that there's something extremely compelling at your museum that somebody else is not being um, addressing in some way, then yes, definitely video is something to do, but don't just do it because everybody else is doing it. Remember, you are not R21, you're not a professional film crew, you do not have the same um, access to resources that they have, so make sure that you understand your limitations and make those limitations a good thing. Make them something that come to your advantage. So if you don't have a five light setup and three different cameras, the nice thing about that is that people are very comfortable talking to one person with a small camera. They get very uncomfortable as soon as you turn on the lights, put a mic on them, and start rolling. So make that some way that is an advantage for you. Um, I think there was also a question about pre and post production guidelines. There's a very good um, resource at the end that we will share as far as that goes. Um, I like this quote a lot because it sort of gets to the point of it. This is somebody that I follow on Tumblr. I've never met this person uh, in person, and it's somebody that is an illustrator. And the real crux of it is you shouldn't really be in the position of just creating content. So don't just go ahead and create content because you have this social media hole to fill and you need to put things out there. Think about what is most important. Think about the story that you want to tell in some way. And think about the most interesting way to do it. The thing to also remember is that the internet is going to do things without you. And that's good. There are certain things that have happened on the internet that maybe as a museum might make us feel uh, uncomfortable slightly. So, but the thing is to try to figure out a way to really make that an advantage. So for example, somebody came in a few years ago and took a picture of every single painting that was on the wall. This is something that as an institution, rights-wise, we do not have the right to do. And in theory, we could um, probably ask this person to take it down or work with them to, to clear rights for all that. But I think that that would be an enormous task. But it ended up being a very beautiful piece because it really showed the whole spectrum of everything that was on view on one day. It really told the story of painting in a very interesting way. And it came off with a sense of authenticity that it probably would not have had if we were putting it out. It would seem more promotional. This is somebody telling the story of how excited they were to visit. And we don't necessarily need to stop that. Um, when Craftwork came to visit, there were a ton of videos of Craftwork. There were a ton of parodies of Craftwork. There were a lot of things going on around it. And it was another one of those situations where the, sometimes the best reaction is to sit back and let the internet do it and then you know, figure out if you want to retweet them, if you want to put them on your Facebook page, or if you want to reach out to them. Um, somebody took a time lapse of the Marina Abramovich webcam that we had, it took a picture of every single person that did uh, that sat and then made an animation of that. And it ended up being something beautiful that we didn't have the time to do ourselves, but it was a really wonderful piece. And so we were able to contact him and put it out and publicize him. Um, there's a guy who comes to almost every opening in New York at a major museum and records the entire exhibition and gets a pretty good view count. Um, that's going to be out there. And it's something that, you know, it makes me wince a little bit because he does things like possibly spells the director's name wrong or gets some of his facts wrong. But at the same time, your options are either to, you know, fight against him or maybe just to work with him and let him know how to spell people's names and, you know, see if there's some way to make what he's doing a little bit better. Um, yes, and Rosanna is pointing out that... Uh, R21 is very small, and yes, it is. Um, I used to intern there, so it's a, a, we definitely love it. So the most important thing, I think, is really to think of video as something to reach the people that you are interested in reaching, find out what of other things that you've seen. It can be a reflection 
by visitors or by uh, a curator or by an educator. It can be anything out there. Um, artists are excited about collaborating, and they're usually, it depends on who the artist is, interested in doing some sort of collaboration. So talk to the artists that you're working with and, and figure out how you can help support what they're doing and figure out what the stories are that you want to tell and figure out how to really get that um, going. And I think that's really the main crux of what I would suggest to anybody that's starting out or wants to continue to build on their video um, production within their institution. And I will pass it over to Emily then. And I welcome anybody, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, and I will get back to you just as soon as I can. Thank you. Thank you, David. Really great presentation. Seems like we've got a lot of great discussion going on in the chat as well. And now we're going to welcome Emily to speak about her, her story today with uh, Art Babel and all the other great video work she's done at the IMA. And Emily, if you're ready, take it away. Yes, absolutely. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, hard to follow up such a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you, David, for all of the great things that you touched on. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the IMA's um, use of video and how we do things here in Indianapolis. Um, I think the important thing that I wanted to start out with to talk about is the fact that museums as an institution tell stories. And um, I've been reading this really wonderful book that I included a slide from, or a quote from on the slide that says, um, story, sacred and profane, is perhaps the main force in human life. Um, a society is composed of fractious people with different personalities, goals, and agendas. What connects us beyond our kinship ties? Story. And I think that um, as I've been reading this book, it's really been changing the way that I think about what a museum's collection is for. And so I want to um, frame some of the work that the IMA does with video around this concept. So um, here at the IMA, I'm on the publishing and media team, and I manage um, the video projects and, as well as our mobile projects here and Art Babel. And I primarily work with our producer, storyteller extraordinaire, um, Daniel Beyer, who is um, our editor. And what I have, um, I everything that the IMA does in terms of video, I have to give him all of the credit for. And I always tell people he's a wonderful storyteller here. And so it's been, um, I'm very lucky to work with him. And if anybody has any more specific questions about that, I would be happy to um, field them or get you in touch with him. But um, our content team as a whole consists of the two of us as well as members of our education staff. And um, I will talk a little bit about my own personal background like David did as well. Um, I came from an arts background. I studied um, fashion design in college and then um, moved into museum studies in graduate school and came to media production through this um, art-specific uh, museum studies background and uh, feel like this, this basis in making in art has given me uh, a bonus as a project manager for digital projects. I think that it has um, been a benefit for how I approach projects and how I approach the storytelling that we do. So um, as I move through my slides here, um, I hope I'm going to give you guys some ways to think about production, distribution, and your content to help you think about how you can use video and specifically video online to think about how you can better tell your stories. Also, thanks for ending your presentation saying content is a dirty word, David. <laughs> um, I'm like furiously scratching it out of my presentation over here. So um, talking a little bit about the life of a video project here at the IMA, um, the way that it works is sort of what I think of as three stages. Um, we have pre, during, and post um, in terms of a video project. And it starts very early on in an exhibition or um, exhibition planning cycle um, where we start working with interpretation planning. 
And with all of our digital projects, as well as video projects, this is going to involve working with the curator and education to determine our goals for the project as a whole. And um, we like to think of video as fitting in as one piece of our larger interpretation goals. So um, we are uh, doing that work very early to outline exactly how um, exactly the goals for the specific video, as well as to think about um, to think about the larger digital picture. And I'll touch on that more in a second. As it moves from interpretation planning, and I would say that that's usually six months out, and about three months out from when we want a project to launch, we're going to go into the um, content gathering and refinement stage. And this involves all of the production, um, filming, uh, or sourcing of material, the editing, um, the refinement, and then the testing towards the end. And all of this work is happening um, in conjunction with myself as well as with my editor here. And uh, we are working with the curator to go back and make sure we're hitting the messages that they want. We usually send a couple different rounds of drafts to them to make sure that we're telling the appropriate stories. Because this work is being done in conjunction with the other digital projects at the time, um, we try to work, make sure that we are not doubling up on the stories that we're telling. And so we're hitting on uh, a specific story that we feel like can be best told with video. Um, and then the last phase, sort of post-production, is organization and output. Um, and so we are determining exactly uh, which channels we want our video to go out through, and David spoke about this very eloquently. Um, the IMA doesn't have um, online learning like the MoMA does, but um, we do feel like we want to make sure we're using, the, we're using uh, channels that make sense. And so if we have video clips that are really standalone or they only make sense in the context of a mobile tour, our content is in context that makes sense for that individual video. Um, another rule that I want to touch on that I think has been really important for our team here is that um, we have determined for our team that we will only produce video that has the and uh, I do want to say um, that our team used to be four people on the video team and we now are down to two. And so we used to be able to film something for conservation that would go into their files and um, figure out exactly, um, you know, figure out exactly what conservation needed and work with them to film a video about what an art, how an artist wants a piece to be treated, and it would be something that would never go live. And as our team has gotten smaller, we actually have determined that um, we, we just don't have the manpower to work on projects like this. So we have worked very hard to train our co workers to be able to do that sort of documenting work on their own. So we have um, flipped a DVD for someone, but we're not going to spend our time editing something that will not go live. And this has been an important uh, switch for our department. Um, I see a comment here that you say, what do you mean by testing? Um, so when I... Uh, when we are getting to the end stages of, um, or I'm sorry, I guess I probably put that on the slide backwards. When we're getting into the end stages of the interpretation planning, we want to make sure that the content that we're creating is going to go to an audience that wants to see it. And David touched on this as well. So we are um, always doing testing to make sure that uh, our audience for that particular exhibition um, is, is interested in what we're going to be saying. And I think that um, I maybe could have used the word evaluation. And Emily, do you mind just repeating that last rule one more time for us? Absolutely. We only produce video that will be published, period. <laughs> 
Great. Is that, Thank is you. that good? That was perfect. Okay. <laughs> so um, now I want to talk a little bit about um, what we've been moving into here at the IMA, which uh, is another thing that we've been thinking a lot about, which is that we um, have spent hundreds of hours producing mobile tours for special exhibitions. And what ends up happening is that after that special exhibition leaves the IMA, none of that content can be used for anything here again. And so we've made a conscious switch in the past Great, and thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, we just made a quick adjustment to our internet connection and audio streaming so that hopefully it'll be a little bit clearer and sharper for you. I know there was a brief little blip there. So Emily, I'll turn it back to you, and if, if you could rewind a tiny bit and uh, just cover the content that you began on this slide, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Um, sorry, everybody. <laughs> So um, I want to talk a little bit about a concept we've been thinking about here at the IMA. Um, Neil has kindly linked to my blog post on Twitter where I, where I spoke about this idea we're working with here that I called hyperopia, which is a term from medicine um, uh, meaning farsightedness. And uh, the way that I use it is to talk about um, how can we spend our valuable time and resources within our um, education and also our media departments making content that has a life beyond a single exhibition. Um, so we try to think about all of our content here um, as having a potential life at the IMA. So I'm going to show you an example exhibition that uh, we did here this summer at the IMA called Snapshot, and we did all of your traditional um, methods for talking about the exhibition. We had a mobile tour that featured clips about the different rooms and the, our curator talking about some of the works in the show. We had a microsite featuring information about the exhibition, videos um, like our exhibition trailer that we had here, as well as um, recorded lectures about the exhibition. But what we also tried to do is to um, work with our curators to make videos about the two works of art in the show that the IMA owned. And you'll notice a, uh, 
a link coming into the chat there um, that is to this video that you can watch. Um, we filmed about 30 collection videos this year, actually. And what we've tried to do is work them into our regular video schedule. And so we worked with um, our curators here uh, to say, when we're sitting down with you to talk about an exhibition or a lecture you're doing or something else, we are going to spend five minutes talking about a work of art from your area of the collection. And we've started making these collection videos so that they can um, complement our new uh, pages on our website, which is not that slide. It's this slide. <laughs> Um, so, what you'll notice here is that we have related media now on our collection pages, and we've created this new format to be able to feature some of this amazing content that we've been creating so that this content can have a life moving beyond an exhibition. So now I'm going to go back a slide and talk a little bit about how we've been thinking about this. Um, so as, as I've mentioned, we have been thinking about video as part of a larger strategy for telling the story of the object and um, thinking about how video might fit into that larger picture. And so um, one of, a couple of the points that I want to talk about that are important for how this works for us um, the IMA, it's important for us to use interdepartmental collaboration. So we need to work with marketing to make sure that the videos that we are producing tell a story as well as share information about the exhibition. Um, it's also important for us that there's a museum-wide prioritization on the collection, which makes our collection videos possible. Um, it is important for us to have a fluid team that maximizes personal strengths. So something that um, I have taken on in my role is being the person who conducts the interviews with our artists. And part of this is because I enjoy talking to people. And so I'm able to easily conduct these interviews um, to get better content in the end. And I think that um, you have to think about who is good for what job to create this content as part of a larger picture of what your museum is producing. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention is that I think it's important to remember that people's experience in museums don't happen in a vacuum. Um, people bring their own history when they come to the museum. And they bring their own history when they interact with your museum on the internet in the same way. So how can we think about our content in relation to the lives and the personal histories that people bring? Um, let's see. Um, another point that I want to mention is how um, online video is exploding right now as a use for education. And the person that everybody's talking about is Salman Khan and the Khan Academy. Art Babel is lucky enough to have um, Smart History as a member, and so I've been able to speak with Beth Harris and Steven Zucker about some of their videos and how they're using that. Um, but one thing that a lot of people think is that museum experiences and online experiences are not compatible. Um, if you approach it with that frame of mind, uh, I think that it's easy to sort of think that a museum and online learning doesn't necessarily have anything to do with each other. But what you can, can think about it as instead is to think about all of these as different ways uh, to access or to, to share the idea of free choice learning. And museums have um, long been, uh, have long been sort of the center for free choice learning. And I think that it's something that museum people are experts in. And this online video revolution as well is about free choice learning and learning at your own pace. So I think that museums are a natural fit for tapping into the online education boom. Um, 
I think that uh, it's important to uh, align your content with um, what your your visitors are looking for uh, in terms of education. And so um, for the IMA, that has been focusing on the primacy of our collection as a storytelling tool online and utilizing those collection videos. Okay. So now, uh, really quick, I think I have five more minutes. Um, I want to talk about Art Babel, and I'm very excited that we were able to relaunch the site um, this past week, actually a week ago from today. Um, you can check it out at artbabel.org. But Art Babel has been an important outlet for the IMA for sharing our video and a great reason um, for us to really continue thinking about how video um, is important for the IMA, but it's also a really great way to get our content within the museum outside of our own walls. So Art Babel was founded in 2009. Um, we decided that we needed a way to share our videos with a wider audience, and the best way to do that was not to create another channel for the IMA where our videos would go and, and sort of disappear into the galaxy that is the Internet. Um, so what we decided to do was invite some partners to join us for sharing videos on a larger interface where we all could um, have our videos indexed together. And this system, uh, we launched it with seven partners, and I'm so proud to announce that we now have um, 54 with more people emailing me every day. Um, we are... Um, so thrilled with the redesign and what it offers in terms of the new organization. And what it enables us to do is that the videos, it doesn't actually really matter anymore if the videos are from the IMA or if they're from MoMA or if they're from a teeny tiny museum in Europe. Um, they can all be indexed together by the same terms and people can find videos um, that are helpful to them within um, the terms that they're already using to look for videos. So something that um, we have noticed is that we, uh, it's very important that, the, that our users, our partner users, are tagging their videos and sharing them um, within this larger organized structure. Um, and so I want to show you some of how we've organized these terms on the new site. So in, it used to just be one bucket, and I would refer to it as our one bucket problem. Um, we have our topics here, and what we've done is taken that one bucket and divided it out into these six categories. And these categories enable our partners to discreetly tag our videos. And by being able to tag within each one of these categories, we are able to um, then index these against one another as filters. So instead of just being able to look for a video about Japanese art, you can look for a video about Japanese art that's also about painting, that's also about contemporary art, and really drill into the exact content that you're looking for. Um, so I'm going to um, wrap up by saying um, Art Babel has been uh, has been growing at a, a fantastic rate, but we are always looking for more partners. It's about strength and numbers. So if you're interested in having your institution join Art Babel, um, I hope that you will give myself and my colleagues an email um, and let us know. Um, what we can do to help you get on the site. Okay, so I'm going to see if there are any other questions. Anybody? Uh, I see a question about uh, requirements for being a partner. The qu requirements for being a partner are that you are an actual institution and uh, that you are producing um, your videos. Other than that, it, we get approval through a small group. We are going to move into the next phase, so I'm going to hand it back over to Neil. Um, if you have any questions or I didn't explain myself clearly, please feel free to get in touch. Emily, thank you so much for that great tour through our Babylon.
really great insight into the production process. So next, we're going to kind of show you some resources that we're going to be making available as a, sl as a slide deck after the presentation um, that kind of cover some other questions um, for us to examine. And then we're going to do sort of a group discussion uh, through, through Q&A at the end. So first, I'm going to show you these quick slides on some resources. So we wanted to make available um, to you some links for video websites, some of the ones we've been talking about today. Um, Met Media is the Met Museum's channel for video. MoMA Video is a YouTube link, so is the IMA link, and then Art Babble, and also Emily mentioned Smart History, which is um, administered by Beth Harris and Steve Zucker. And these videos appear in Art Babble, also on Google Art Project, and they're great interviews and kind of personal touches to exploring art in on the on the video experience. The next set of resources we have for you is tools, right? How do I make video? How do I make video on the on a dime? How do I make video with open source tools? So David and Emily have provided some great links here um, to share with you on ways you can find music for your videos, ways you can get free players, on um, those kinds of things. And uh, those are available here for you. And we'll have these slides available on SlideShare. So if, you, if you're not getting all the links now, don't worry. And then some references and tips. So these are some websites that have guides on how to make a video through the whole production process or just to get started on video. So these are great resources out there for you as well. And then also as a reminder, as Lego mentioned earlier today, our next workshop is coming up on e-publishing. So if you're really enjoying this workshop today, uh, consider joining us again for NCN Pro 2. And now, thank you to our presenters for their long-form presentations. And now we're going to jump into our kind of group discussion and Q&A. We're going to go over some more specific topics. And then at the end of that group discussion between Emily, myself, and David, we'll answer all of your questions as best we can from the chat. So if Adam, we can have the group discussion slide deck. Great. And that'll be up in just one second. Thank you. We have a few questions pending in the chat box as well. Did you say you wanted to address those after you had a chance to to discuss as a group? Yeah, I think it's I think it's what we'll we'll do. Okay, great. And I'd like to remind everyone: please feel free to continue to enter questions in now. We're going to be collecting those and setting those aside so that we can address them as uh, we enter our Q and A period. We have a few queued up from along the way, but we did try to answer some as we were moving through. on the chat there, Michelle had a great question about how do you encourage reciprocal video responses from people. Um, Michelle, I don't know if you've seen, uh, last year I did the first uh, crowdsourced YouTube panel for NCN 2011. And my entire panel was crowdsourced. So I sent out the call via Twitter, via listservs, uh, personal conversations, and I asked participants from all over the world to make videos to answer the questions of my panel. And I was able to get submissions from some brilliant folks in the museum community, in the digital humanities world, in the archivist community. So I think the way you get video responses to your content is to ask people for those responses and to really put the time out there via social media to engage them.
And just to give you a preview as we are uh, loading up the next deck, uh, we are going to be talking about video services, what makes a video service, how um, you can make a decision between which services to use, as well as um, rights and some other uh, discussions that we will have as far as specific issues. And I know that we've had a good number of questions about um, file format issues, branding techniques, workflows, uh, bilingual, unilingual, ADA. So I think we're going to try to address as many of these as we can get through it at this point. We still have plenty of time to go through our group discussion here and answer your questions. So, David, kick us off. All right. So I am going to talk a little bit about the elements of a video platform. This may be the point that if you have a coffee on hand, you may want to take a big swig for uh, <laughs> because it is a little dry at point. But basically what I want to talk about is the elements of making a video platform or choosing one that already exists. So um, to go through this process very briefly, you have created a video. I'm very proud of you. Um, you should be very proud of yourself. The most important thing with this video is to make sure that you keep as much raw material as you're going to need to be able to use in the future, and you keep the highest possible export that you can and start with that raw material. Um, in the time that I've been working here, we made a couple mistakes at the beginning because we uh, compressed things down to 640 by 480 pixels, figuring that was high enough res, um, and at this point that is barely suitable for a phone. So just know that video is going to keep changing, so if you can keep the original material, uh, that's great, and keep that raw footage somewhere, um, at the bare minimum you want a full res, high res copy of it. Uh, ideally it would be uncompressed. For a lot of our stuff we have to compress it because there is an issue um, with storage after a while. The uh, different video platforms like YouTube or Vimeo almost always have information on what the most suitable upload um, strategy uh, is for that and how to be able to get up onto that. Um, and then they kind of differ from there. But what happens anyway is that you start the upload process and then a variety of actions occur and they are mainly grouped into two areas, hosting and serving. And anytime you work with a content delivery network, there's going to be some charge for either hosting or serving or some other type of charge, and we will talk about that. So what a network does for you is that it provides video file storage. It may not provide a high-res video file storage. So that's something to be aware of. It will store some metadata, so things that you enter, like the title, the tags, those type of information is stored in a database as well. And then it will store um, specific captions and media. So for example, with YouTube, it auto-generates captions. They're hilarious to look at. They're wildly um, incorrect. But you have the ability to upload your own captions, as well as on a lot of other platforms, you have that possibility. Um, Media-wise, it's usually only an image that is an icon for it that you can use. Um, a series of things happen with transcoding. So the basic concept is you take that high-res video file, it is then squeezed down into a number of different formats. In some providers, that will be one format and one format for mobile. In some formats like YouTube, they will do a wide variety and then they will serve up whatever is the most relevant for the connection speed of the person connecting to you. So as those things happen, then your user connects and streams or downloads the content. And then what happens is there is some sort of um, digital rights management or very brief check of if there are limitations on geographic um, things. So for example, on YouTube, sometimes you're unable to play something that geographically may not be available to you. On uh, Netflix, that might be the same issue. On Hulu, that's definitely an issue. And then there is an FLV or bitrate detection that happens. So what I mean by that is somebody connects to the content delivery network, the computer does a check to make sure, does the person have flash? If so, I will play a flash version. Are they on a slow, medium, or fast connection? And I will serve up whatever connection speed um, 
size of file makes sense for them. So sometimes if you're watching something um, like The Daily Show or any of those larger provided network shows, you'll notice that things will get blocky at a certain point. It's because there's been a bit rate detection of your connection speed going down. So instead of it stopping the serving altogether, it then switches to one that's more suitable for your connection speed. Now, let's take a look at an example with YouTube. So there's your wonderful cat video. Uh, in this case, this was a promo that we had done for an iPad app. So as a CDN, YouTube does all of these features, but does them in a certain way. So you upload the video. They maintain a smaller version of the video file, but they do a number of different transcodes on it so that it's mobile compatible, it's compatible on a slower speed. A lot of times if you're on YouTube, there's a little gear button, and the gear button uh, is where you can set 340p, um, 1080p, anything like that. So you can set what type of video file that you want to have access to. You enter the metadata in the back end, so you type in the title, the description, all of that information. You can upload captions or upload media, or they try to generate a lot of these things on their own. And then the person, as they connect, there's some sort of DRM to make sure that you have marked this video as publicly available to everyone and that they are serving the most suitable uh, version for you. The cost is free to YouTube, so it's free to you. Um, there's a big asterisk there because as you're making a decision as to which services you want to partner your content with, you have to make a decision as to how open you are about things being repurposed, about them being changed. YouTube is constantly changing the look and feel of their player. They're changing whether ads are served or not served. The community itself is also something to determine as to what type of community you want to have around your content. Um, YouTube is a good community. It's not good discussion usually, but the community itself is good because of the sheer size of it and because YouTube, um, because Google has put enough money into it or has put, some would say, too much money into buying YouTube, so they're not going to let online video get away from them. Vimeo and those types of smaller um, channels offer a more specialized audience. The content usually looks a little bit better, but at the same time, it's a trade-off of uh, how many people can you reach versus something like YouTube. So it's all a, a balancing act for you as a um, content provider. Now, there are ways to do this type of setup on your own. So initially, when Art Babel started up, for example, there was a type of open source software uh, model being used where things were being uploaded to the cloud, they were being transcoded with FFmpeg, and then there was a player front end. Um, in some examples, for example, there's a open source player called JW Player, and they now do back end hosting and um, content delivery. And it's the same type of thing where they do the transcoding, you set what transcoding settings you want, they drop it onto Amazon S3, and so it's available in the cloud anywhere within the world. So those functions are kind of broken up. The cost there is free in that they're open source, but in some cases you're paying for hosting, in some cases you're paying for transcoding, in some cases you're paying for the player, in some cases you're paying out of your own developer's time. So it really is a question of if you have developers that can build these things for you. In the end, the real big takeaway is what can you support in-house as far as these services? Can you host your own things? Can you provide transcoding? Can you do streaming? Um, what can you afford to pay for? Can you afford to pay for a developer? Can you... Is there something where you want to make the connection in the example that Emily was giving on the collection page on IMA's website, they probably aren't using a service like YouTube for that. I think uh, Emily can kind of chime in um, if that's incorrect. Yeah, we are using um, hosted video formats, I believe. Um, yeah, because so those need to make a connection to your um, backend collection. Correct. And we've also, um, as you were mentioning with the JW player, that is the um, new player on the new Art Babel. Oh, okay. So that's what we're using as well, yeah. Yeah, so you'll see that a lot on different sites that people have customized JW Player or other similar players. I always encourage people, if you see 
a video on a website and it looks like something um, you're interested in looking at, then view the source for the page and almost always you can figure out are they using JW Player, are they using Brightcove, are they using some other service that offers different functionality. So really it's a question of balancing um, what your tolerance is at a museum and what your budget is as a museum. Um, David, I'm going to jump yeah. in really quick. I've just put a link in the chat to one of our new collection pages. Um, you'll notice that the first video is hosted and the second and third videos are embedded directly from YouTube. Yeah. So we use a combination. Mm -hmm. um, getting to another question that uh, is in the chat, the investment of self-hosted versus uploading to somewhere else, uh, that is a nice little segue for uh, the next slide in just a second. But we really, um, the, the last question is, do you need to do a paywall or digital rights management? Do you need to localize for different areas of the world? Are you going to do payment processes? Do you need to set up some sort of paywall? All of those are kind of questions to build off of um, and decide as far as uh, your final decision. Oh, I think there was one other slide in here, but I will just basically recreate it in a lovely chart here. So the whole thing really is the cost versus the customization. And so in some cases, you'll have something like um, YouTube that's very low cost, very low customization. You'll have something like um, a... A JWU player or their backend called Bits on the Run, that is somewhat of a cost, offers more customization. Brightcove um, can be more costly. It all depends on how your account is set up, but it offers a lot more customization and a lot more features. So it really becomes a question of balancing out those three things and deciding what makes the most sense for you. Um, to kind of go back really quickly to some of the other questions we had, the file format the big thing really is to save the highest possible format that you can, whether it's a QuickTime movie or an MP4. Um, there is no universal format, unfortunately, for video. I, I think anybody that tells you is probably um, trying to get you to switch everything to their format. The nice thing about having a service like Brightcove, like YouTube, like Bits on the Run is that a lot of that transcoding can be handled on their end. So, for example, when um, we were using our own, we do our own custom player for MoMA.org, and the transition to mobile format was a little painful because we had to then manually go back and transcode and re-upload everything. Um, it does mean that we are able to contain costs a little bit more, but it does have that sort of trade-off as to um, when things are, are changing within the video format, which they will continue to do, then you have the ability when you have a service that you're paying for that a lot of those processes will be happening on the back end. Great. Thank you, David. I think Emily is going to lead our next area of discussion here on metrics. Absolutely. So David and I worked together. Um, he gave me some uh, slides from... MoMA metrics as well, but I want to talk about um, a little bit about how metrics, I think, can be the foundation for really creating great video content. Um, it's about aligning what you're creating with with who you're creating it for. And so we use metrics here, and, and the IMA specifically uses a combination of the metrics available on YouTube with the metrics available through Google Analytics. Um, to figure out who's watching our videos, what kinds of videos are getting watched, and then um, use these as a way to think about uh, whether or not we have any biases, um, myself included. And so something that we started out doing a long time ago uh, was making longer video. But as we started to look at our metrics, we realized nobody watches our video past two minutes. <laughs> so we started to really have to think about um, creating video that's going to be successful. Because when it's successful, that gives us the ammunition we need to advocate for our next project. Um, so <laughs> this slide is courtesy of David. <laughs> Chime in if you want. Um, but view count is actually not the best 
metric, although it is important. Um, the first way, the, the primary three ways that we want to think about how you can measure uh, looking, how people are looking at your videos is video engagement. And this is um, going to be your audience retention throughout the course of the video. You see the one uh, on the right here is from the IMA, and that shows how many people are staying with the video through the duration of the video. Um, David, do you want to talk about the MoMA one? Sure. I think the one on the left um, is from our on-site player. And I think the, the big thing with metrics is trying to remember that it's not usually going to tell you uh, the more qualitative story. So in this case, it looks like if you look at our um, engagement that we are seeing this massive drop from when the video is played to when 25% of it is played. But what you're really not seeing here is that a lot of the times we will have pages where video is audio auto playing. So if somebody goes onto a page, it auto plays, and then they go down to the bottom and select something else, it stops playing. And that then counts as somebody not reaching the 25% uh, marker. The other thing to kind of bear in mind is that in this case, um, with the YouTube retention, you'll see that it's by specific time point, uh, which is why it's a really nice uh, piece of analytics. With the one that we did, we tried to do percent played. The other issue with this, so it's 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent played, is that if we have an hour long video and somebody watches for, you know, 10 minutes, it's not going to be counted as a 25 percent played. I think the nice thing to also look at is. Once somebody has gotten to a certain point, what is your retention after that? So you'll see this in both cases that once somebody is at a certain point, there's a pretty good rate of retention throughout that. So in our case, if somebody has reached the 25% retention or 25% played within the video, we're relatively certain that they're going to get to 50 and maybe even to 70 and possibly to 100%. That's great. Um, what we are seeing here at the IMA is I think it's a relatively new statistic that they're charting on YouTube. Um, so you can actually see it here is that um, we, it's showing average view duration. And so that's something that we've really been using to inform how long we want to make our videos. And that's not saying that we can't post a lecture that's 45 minutes, but to think about the fact that um, Simply, you know, if 90% of our audience doesn't watch past two minutes, we need to think about what that means for us. Um, this one is video time viewed. And so um, we are getting, uh, we're, as you look at the numbers here, this is for uh, a video that the IMA did called The Universe is Flux for a uh, small exhibition here. And it was percentage of the video viewed over time. And something that has been good about this is that we can see in relation to events happening at the IMA, if people are pulling up our page on the IMA website and seeing this video on the exhibition page or on the object page here um, when we had an event um, here featuring this artist. Uh, David? Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. The other thing to sort of point out is that um, Emily has very wisely drilled down on one specific video and that you're not trying to do an aggregate. The aggregate starts to get a little bit problematic in some ways. Um, and you also have certain things that come up that aren't really then reflected. So, for example, we have a video with Yoko Ono that has gotten somewhere near, I think, a million views or something like that. Um, the story that's not being told in the metrics is that it was featured, I think, on the Howard Stern show or something like that. And so people then started listening to it. And with YouTube, there's this sort of pile-on effect that as something gets views, it gets more views because things are still based on uh, Google search analytics so that the recommended video that comes up afterwards is based on how many views it's gotten. So it's something that if you have something that starts to get a good popular following, it then keeps getting a popular following. So it's sort of a um, views beget views, which is unfortunate because it's hard to get those initial views out there. And then the last one that I want to touch on is video playback locations. Um, this is another, I think this one is from um, 
YouTube analytics. Um, and what we're looking at here is the different places where people were seeing IMA videos. And this has been important for us as we we have begun to think about the IMA website redesign and doing a mobile website. We have seen our um, mobile user skyrocket, so you'll see that number here. And uh, we also see a lot of our videos get a lot of playback when they are embedded on other websites. So just an important thing to think about, um, you know, if you can encourage a local blog blog that's popular um, to continue sharing your video or if you can embed it through YouTube and then encourage people to watch that on their mobile phones. It's an important way to think about um, how people are accessing your content. Do you want to say anything about that, David? Yeah, I think that that's a great point. The, the, the point that the real thing that's going to get you above and beyond um, just having things out there on your own pages is really partnering with somebody that is interested in the content and doing other blogging about it. So a lot of times, um, I know that we had a street artist interview and we worked with a blog that we've done some work with before that made sure that they knew that that was coming out. So when they posted it, we got that specific audience that's already going to them for that in that information is then serving our content. So I think that that's part of the process is that there's such diverse content within an art museum that it's very hard to necessarily find all of the different places that it might connect to and trying to figure out where those places uh, would be the most useful. I think there was another question in the chat about tracking analytics over multiple platforms for the same videos. That is a huge issue. I, I, there are services that will do it for you. Um, and I don't think that we have engaged those services uh, really heavily, but I think that that is something that's um, underestimated is the amount of time it takes to really dive into these analytics and uh, get some good meaningful data across everything for it. I think I think that's a great point, and I think what we have tried to do here in terms of tracking over multiple websites is rather than think about video as a discrete category, we think about video as part of larger projects. So rather than thinking about all of the IMA's videos, we think about that Tawara video that I just showed you as part of the Tawara project. And so how can we um, track it within that project, thinking about engagement um, within that exhibition? Um, so uh, I think that maybe for me that somehow mentally makes it a little bit easier um, to wrap my head around exactly what I'm looking at instead of saying, you know, the IMA videos get 100,000 views on YouTube a year, but to rather say, okay, what are we getting for this project over time? How much of these videos are people watching? Yeah, and then to also have a very clean um, goal and understanding as to what <laughs> With more educational content, you're really trying to get out there and find people that are interested in it. And it may be that it has a smaller view, but it has a larger retention time where people are sharing it more. Um, I think we had a question before as far as the duration, and this kind of goes back to what Emily was saying earlier. The average duration for us is also around uh, 130 to 2 minutes for an aggregate across all videos, which I think is a sort of universal we're seeing on um, a lot of different platforms. We've tended to think of things as either being, if they're for a general audience, trying to keep it to 30 to 60 seconds. Um, if it's for a somewhat interested art audience, try to keep it to three to five minutes. And if it's for somebody who really is interested in the history of a specific thing, then make it as long as you need to while it's interesting and try to just make it as rich and interesting as possible. So it could be that it's you know an hour-long um, symposium that somebody wants to watch and they want the whole thing. I think that's a great point. I think something else you can think about doing, which is what we have thought about doing with our collection pages, is keeping each collection video under two minutes, but we can make three of them if we want. So keeping each one of those to a central idea about that object or about that exhibition or whatever. And then um, maybe, you know, making 
two or three. Mm -hmm. And as far as the, the question we had in the um, chat is about accessing content through blogs and other partners, I think the the thing that is unfortunate is that a lot of times people like the art might know the name of the artist, unfortunately may not know the name of the museum that they saw the art or artist at. So the the real focus for us is that a lot of times people do not go onto YouTube and search for museum video. They search for what it is they're interested in, and it may be that they don't remember the name of the guy who did the video piece that they saw, or they saw this guy who did these installations that were a bunch of different colors of tape. And so they go on looking for those terms of tape artist. They don't look for uh, was installed at Tate, was installed at MoMA. So I think that that's kind of the key is trying to, that's why it's, it's important to try to find other communities that are interested in the topics that you're talking about and try and do, uh, get the content out that way as well. Brilliant. Um, so now I think we are, um, unless any other questions are coming through right now, we are passing it over to Neil to lead up the conversation about um, rights and digital pres preservation. Well, thank you guys for that great um, explanation. And uh, you actually touched on several of the issues I just want to cover briefly. David already said several times, keep the highest quality raw material that you have. and. Uh, in my experience with digital asset management, I can tell you the best place to put that is in one central system. Um, so you want to, if you don't have a digital asset management system already, you should really be considering getting one and planning for the storage of video and perhaps even multiple iterations of video of that content in your system. And uh, David also mentioned tags, right? So the way that museum professionals may organize information, whether it's a curatorial label or a collections page on an exhibition website, this is, I think, perhaps in the future, and some museums are already doing it now, uh, like the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the IMA has tags. Um, Cooper Hewitt, I think, it does tagging as well. Having having user-contributed tags help define our content so that it's more searchable. And if you decide those tags are valuable, you could even add them to the assets in your dam to help uh, help that retrieval process. A key portion of that finding what you put in the in the dam is metadata. Um, so you're going to be relying upon the information that you tag assets with to make it findable and searchable, not only for your staff or the various projects that they need, but also on the end of the planet. And then with, with rights to, David and Emily have both talked about various examples of working with artists or independent contractors or in-house staff. It's important to think about rights as an, as an entire strategy or process from the beginning to the end of the project. So if it requires a model release for someone to enter your gallery space and be videoed, consider it working with your counsel's office to design the paperwork that's necessary for that. Make sure you digitize those documents and that they're also available from the dam so you can refer to them should you need to have a reference to the specific issue that comes up. You can also try um, a disclaimer sign, as, as David mentioned, maybe effective strategy as well. Uh, so keep an awareness about rights whenever you're creating content and that it's not, it's not something that waits to the, to the 11th hour when you've done all this hard work and arranged all of these different events and efforts. Um, that it's something, oh no, this question comes up. Think about it from the beginning. Another thing to keep in mind is that YouTube especially, but I think also Vimeo now, uh, enables you to share videos with Creative Commons licenses. If you don't know about Creative Commons, it's one of the, the children of Lawrence Lessig, who's a famous um, lawyer and speaker about intellectual property. And the great thing about Creative Commons is that it allows other people to reuse and remake the content that you create. So this may not be applicable in all cases, but if you're working with a contemporary artist who advocates and feels it's important to remix the work that you do, you may want to consider talking with them about Creative Commons. In other cases, Creative Commons may not be appropriate for what you're doing. And the last point I want to make out, too, with contemporary art issues is that if you're working with living artists, you have different constraints than you would if you're working to create a video in your galleries of Rembrandt painting. Um, so if you're working with a contemporary artist, make sure you're working with that artist's representatives or attorneys to work out the various issues that you have when you're making a video and uh, manage those things before, like I said, before the 11th hour. So, And also remember that preservation is an ongoing process. and if you have a digital asset management team in your museum, if you have people that care about that, 
um, set up a meeting with them, send them an email, and uh, try to get those various video files and images off of your network share or your local hard drive and connect it to the larger system of the museum. So that's, those are my points on preservation and rights, unless Emily and David have any other comments on that. Um, I would I would double what you said about um, about having a central repository. That has been very, very important for us. And I think that um, it's something that is easy as you have multiple people working on a project to have something get saved here, something get saved on somebody's, you know, um, desktop, hard drive, et cetera. But it's been really important for us at the IMA to start out with having a you know meeting of the minds determining an overall strategy and then making sure that everyone follows that so that in 3 years when someone has left the team and somebody else has to find that old footage it's somewhere where you can access it yeah i think that that is a huge issue and i've been I'm always very nervous about it on our end as far as um everything being saved because it does become a massive um storage issue, and I've been encouraged that other museums are having the same sort of issues, but I think that as storage is getting cheaper, there are ways to address it. Uh, it's very good to have a copy somewhere on something like a dam that is protected, backed up, labeled, and then probably some sort of local copy so that if you need to retrieve footage to do a quick edit on something or um, pull together something for a presentation that someone's working on, then you have that quickly accessible and local. But if something happens to that copy, you're completely in the clear with the um, version being up on the dam and everything is, is safe there. And uh, just to add to that, David, if you have if you if you have a digital asset management system that can do transformations for you, that can do the various on the fly tasks you would need for video for a PowerPoint presentation or to display at a lecture, that's also a benefit that you may be able to find with a, a dam when you buy when you choose your vendor. So that yeah. you wouldn't have to keep multiple duplicate local copies. Yeah, and that's I, I think to to get to that, we get a lot of um, requests from people that I'm doing a presentation. I just want this 30 seconds of this video. If we were to do that. On our own, it would mean ingesting that, cutting it, exporting it back out, saving exactly. it to something in a version they can use. A good dam will let you set the points that you want and export out a version in Windows Media. For example, somebody's on a PC and needs to present with a PowerPoint. So exactly. it's something that's a little bit more universal. Excellent. Great. I think that's the end of uh, the slide think, portion. Yeah, the, the one thing I would like to really kind of quickly talk about with sure. rights that we have talked about is, um, I mean, obviously there's image rights is a whole loaded issue I don't really want to get into, but the um, the other thing to kind of consider is music rights. Um, and I think music in general is something that is not talked about enough in video production, and it really makes a uh, phenomenal difference in making your video seem more watchable, <laughs> more enjoyable, meaning that people will actually stay for longer than that two minutes. Um, and so there are a couple different libraries out there of stock music, and usually if you talk to them, you may be able to negotiate a cheaper rate with them um, or something that will give you a longer stretch for that music. If you can find local musicians or somebody that you know that can help you come up with some general um, video that they can use, or, I'm sorry, some general audio that you can use throughout in different videos. That's also a great thing. And then one of the resources we mentioned was, um, I think, Free Music Archive. There are a couple different sites like that that are Creative Commons licensed material that you can use that you then don't have to worry about the issues that you do with music. Um, the problem with music that you have is that there are usually two different right holders for the actual composition and for the performance, so it becomes tremendously hard and very expensive to be able to just get a simple piece of music to put onto mention, your video. Not, I mean, not, not just to mention as well the fact that there could be additional holders on the actual digital copies itself, the digital material itself, like the yes. file itself, or the producers of that material. So that's why, I said, as I said before, plan for your rights management ahead. <laughs> Um, and I will echo and, and just say that um, we we use uh, stockmusic.net a lot here, and so it doesn't have to be free uh, for it to be cheap, you know. So there are a lot of websites that offer music files for $20, um, and then we have used, you know, after a few years go by, we use them again. So um, we felt that 
it's just easier just to buy the rights than worry about trying yeah. to track that down. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. The, we use a lot of things from a service called The Diner. Um, they're a more professional level, so we tend to only use it for things that we know we want to try to get a wide circulation or use on because um, the point that you don't really care for. Great. So I think our next step is to throw up a few more polls for you to answer, and then we have a queue of questions that we've been following throughout the presentation, and we'll be trying to go through those and answer as many of those as we can until 2 o'clock. And then you can, of course, um, reach out to any of us, and we'll be happy to continue the discussion with you. So we're seeing our first question here is, should NCN expand its online workshop community activities? We're seeing 100 percent. So that's good. Um, well, it's shrinking a little bit now. Well, no. <laughs> now it's back up. Okay. They're fickle. They're fickle. <laughs> oh, we have some dissenters, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> we're glad you're here anyways, and you've joined us, and your feedback's important. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think our... Our next step for, for us is to kind of tackle some of these questions that we've, we've seen come up. Um, I think uh, there was a question about universal video format. I believe that David's already mentioned that there is no um, silver bullet. There's no universal format. But could we, could we perhaps point to um, what you would consider being the best examples of raw material? David? Um, I like to try to keep the raw material that we shoot. So we sometimes will shoot with XD cams. We sometimes will shoot with 5Ds. We sometimes will shoot with um, some of the new Canon cameras. The, the problem with that is that a lot of times you then have to ingest and prepare things for editing. So it's not a, a silver bullet in being able to use just that stuff. But if you keep that high-res material, most video editing software you can then pull it into. For our exports, um, we export out uh, full res HD. Uh, we unfortunately have to compress it to H264 to try to keep it within a reasonable size. Um, the I like H264 because it is somewhat universal. There is a question as to whether there's ever going to be a charge for using that format, and it does tend to wash out the color profile a little bit. So you'll see things will get a little bit um, just whiter overall, and you won't have as rich a color um, palette for it. Great. Uh, let's see here. We had another question about um, multiple languages. How, how do you guys handle bilingual video or multilingual video? Um, that is a big issue for us. I think that one thing that we haven't touched on as much is, and this is an issue that I think we all are trying to address as uh, strongly as possible, is just basic accessibility to start with. So to be able to get a transcript and captions available for the native language um, is sort of a first step. Uh, we use a couple different services to generate captions as well as services to do um, transcription. In our ideal workflow that we try to follow, we try to get most of the main content transcribed as well as the final export. What usually ends up happening is more to the point that we get the final export um, transcribed. And there's a lot of services you can use online where people will transcribe things for you at a relatively reasonable rate. Um, as long as you allow for a longer window, and then you usually have to go back in and clean up some of the our historical language uh, mm -hmm. for that. And then as far as multiple languages, if you can then get a caption or transcript of the native language, it's um, a lot easier to get that flipped, but it is extremely expensive. I, I mean, the the most reasonable way we've been able to do it is to find a native speaker who has some background in the arts that we know can do a good um, simulacrum or a good simulation of what a proper uh, transcript would look like. But then there are services that can do um, that multi-language support. I mean, that would be the ideal scenario, and it's something that I know every museum would love to offer full multilingual support throughout their website in every different you know, text and video, but it's it's sort of a resource issue. And one more final point on transcription in terms of resources for you both is, do you think that museums can be better prepared to do kinds of crowdsourcing initiatives with transcriptions and with tagging that would engage the user community that would not only enhance the content, but also make it more searchable? 
I think there's definitely a, a possibility there, and I think we all can cite TED as, you know, a great example of crowdsourcing those transcriptions. I also personally think that the um, sort of uh, leaps and bounds that uh, automatic transcriptions are making right now um, are hopefully going to make it a lot easier for those to simply be automatic on future video players. But um, I, I think that there's a lot of possibility there. I think that it's going to take um, potentially a, you know, a leader in the field to sort of bridge that. The IMA has been in discussions with a company called 3Play Media about um, the potential to uh, do something like that for Art Babble, but it was it's it's still, you know, really just a wish for us. I, I feel the same way that David does. Um, yeah. That it, you know, that it would be lovely, but we can barely afford to do them in English. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing to, to kind of bear in mind um, is at this point, the, the thing that really frustrates me with video is that it's not easily searchable. It's getting easier to point people to specific points in videos, for example, um, but you don't have that text extract function. But I, I believe that in the next three to five years, we're going to see those things really take off and the text recognition will get a lot better than it is at this point. So at least that could give you something to start with and then you can kind of go from there. Um, I know that's not a very good answer, but I think that that is one of the issues with video is that it's, it's extremely hard to search across right. and it's, it's starting to get better. Great. That's our next question I think I'm also very interested in, too, so I wanted to hear your, your feedback about this. Have people have been experimenting with Skype, FaceType, and Google Hangouts, and how, have, how has that been or not been incorporated into your digital strategy with video? Um, we've tried a few things through our different streaming initiatives. Um, I think that we have stayed away from doing Skype or um, FaceTime or Google Hangouts at a large degree because the technology is changing so much and I'm always concerned with what do you end up with in the end, like what is the export from that. So uh, is it a file that I'm going to be able to pull from the session that is going to be usable in some way? Um, the, the other sort of issue is the, uh, the software, I mean, as you all know from logging in today, there are little setup processes you need to go through and there are hurdles that need to be cleared for people to be able to download things and stream things and have an audio connection. So it's a little bit of an issue. I've seen it work very well when there are one-to-one -one connections. So when you Skype somebody into a public presentation and then you're recording that presentation in some way. Um, Google Hangouts, I've done some classes with Google Hangouts and actually was lucky enough to have Beth Harris come and visit uh, a class I was teaching, but it's another one of those things where the technology is so rapidly changing at this point that um, it, it's kind of hard to get a handle on. I think SF MoMA has been doing some interesting things with uh, Google Hangouts that they've been trying to do some chats recently, so I would take a look at what they've got on their site, because I know that they have things coming up in the next couple of months that should um, be interesting test cases. Great. Emily, what's your experience with that? We've been thinking about using um, Skype uh, for an upcoming project that will be happening here. We're reopening our European, or I guess opening our European design galleries. And so um, even though I would love it if they would send me to Italy to go interview all of the designers, um, it's looking like we're potentially going to be using Skype as an interview tool. Mm -hmm. So um, we will we'll be really exploring that in the upcoming months. I have to really just echo what David said and say that at this point it's 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 hard to get a handle on. Um, so if anybody has any uh, work that they've been doing on with on their on their own exhibitions about this, I'd love to see more information about it. Great. Another question. And, that's I think I'm, is, oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, I think somebody in the chat was pointing out that, uh, yes, the new Google Hangouts, and in the last six months, that that platform has really expanded and gotten uh, a lot stronger as far as what you get out of it. And so it does end up um, exporting out to YouTube, and I think you can pull an MP4 from that. Um, I, I think you also saw a very interesting use 
that the tape did with uh, Ai Weiwei, where they had a um, video camera within the museum where people were able to pose questions to the artist. Those videos were then shared with him, and he, while he was under house arrest, was able to respond to them. Um, so it wasn't a kind of one-to-one FaceTime, Skype, um, Google Hangout, but it was that simulated process with people being able to pose questions and him being able to respond to it. Um, and I think that I, we've seen that a couple times with people posing questions to Twitter, to artists. So I think that it's it's a logistical issue more than it necessarily is a technology issue entirely. Great. All right. Next question I want to kind of come, the next two I want to pose are first, um, who in your institution is responsible for creating the overall digital strategy for video? And then secondly, how do you integrate video within social media? I'll let Emily um, do this one first. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, I was going to, I'll start off by saying that um, our digital team is really spaced out uh, across four different departments. And so we actually have a digital planning team that meets, that has representatives from each of those four departments. That's our um, marketing and public affairs department, our publishing and media department. meet and are really determining strategy moving forward. And then we also have an interpretation team, which is um, pub, um, publishing and media and audience engagement. And so we are starting off with, um, with discussions about all of these different needs for every exhibition and every project that we're doing here um, on a monthly basis within these teams. and. Uh, they are really setting sort of the, those two different teams are setting the direction for each of these projects. I, I'm not exactly sure if that really answers what you were just asking. Is that, is that good enough? More, yeah, more so just all thinking about who are the stakeholders internally that are developing your content strategy for video. And is, is it the people in, just in your media production area, people in digital asset management, is it the people that are outside of digital media, like the impact of curators or educators on your process? Yeah, so I would say it's going to be those two teams that are then reporting back to the larger teams for the exhibitions or projects, which the curators would sit on, the digital asset management team would sit on that. So um, it's it's about um, sort of group consensus within our smaller group and then taking it back to that larger group. Um, and then I also want to say our Twitter um, and social media is run through our public affairs department. And so um, a lot of that interfacing is done in those digital strategy team meetings. And then um, she's responsible for the output of video through those channels. Okay. David, can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah. I think it kind of also gets to a question that somebody had earlier about workflow from um, you know, something being proposed to something then coming to fruition. Uh, we, we try to go, as Emily has pointed out, make sure that everything that we're doing and shooting is something that can be put out publicly. I mean, we do have an AV team that does uh, documentation and does that type of video content. Um, as far as the overall overarching uh, strategy goes, when we started about six years ago, we pulled together a group of people from uh, across the organization, so people from communications, from um, press and communications, from marketing, from education, from graphic design, from digital media. Uh, there wasn't as much of a curatorial input at that point, and the idea was really to just share information across departments so that if somebody knew that an exhibition was coming up that might have something interesting, then it would come back to that group. And so that group really met on a regular basis, and we've now broken it down so that it's we meet on a quarterly basis, and we talk about what is in process, what's coming up. Um, we have a small budget that we're able to assign to major projects, and I think the most important thing from those meetings is just to make sure that all the people that need to know about something know about it so that our people in the press department can put something in the press release for an exhibition, for example, or the educators can know to make that available to um, their other education staff so that when somebody's teaching a lesson, they may be able to use the resources in some way, and that our social media um, 
masters, if you will, will make sure that they are on top of things. And our social media as a whole is managed uh, through our marketing team and us. So it's sort of a split. Um, and so there are a few people that have access to those accounts. And it's just a matter of kind of keeping up to date with them about what's coming up. So that I'm definitely in a lot more contact with the um, people that run the Facebook and Twitter accounts so that if I know that something comes up quickly and we're going to live stream it, I make sure that they're aware of that and they have something in the queue. And they're you know happy to hear about those things. They, they need that sort of feedback loop. Um, so it's kind of a cross-departmental team that pulls things together. And sort of going back to that idea of workflow, there are definitely things where we know there's going to be a year-long initiative that has come from a curator. We sit down and we plan that together. We figure out the strategy. But there are certainly times where somebody's putting something up today. We have to make a gut call really quickly if we have the time to support that um, and are going to be able to roll that out. And there are definitely times when that happens. And so it's about having that fluidity and agility to make those calls without necessarily then having to fill out a form to send to a group that then signs off on the form that then releases the fund that then you know, <laughs> produces right. the content. So it's just a matter of being able to have that, that flexibility. Exactly. Great. One question that came up was um, using video as a tool to engage K-12 students. And how, how is that done by our institutions? Um, K-12 is a, a great audience uh, to engage with as much as possible. The, um, the challenge really with the K-12 audience is, is that the network staff in a lot of those districts, uh, there's severe limitations as to what they can get to. And I think I'd put this in the chat. YouTube is trying to create sort of a safe space within YouTube. Uh, that's called youtube.com uh, slash schools. And it's kind of a, an area where only those videos live. So network administrators can turn on those um, things for people to be able to use. I mean, the, the way that I always think of it whenever I'm teaching this for teachers is that video can be part of what the teacher is using in preparation for instruction. It can be something they use in the classroom, so they may pull out a section of something, or it can be something that they use for follow-up. Um, and I think teachers are very adept at being able to, or adept at being able to pick things up and use them as they need them. Um, I saw a great museum educator actually at the Met who had an iPad and had one of those straps on the back of it and gave a lecture or gave a, a, a gallery conversation about a piece in the collection and then as part of that brought up a quick iPad clip and showed that clip to the group. And so it was a to incorporate video without it being this overwhelming um, thing. It was just another tool in their toolkit. Um, that's a great point, David. And actually, I'm going to use this to tout Art Babel, the Art Babel redesign again. Um, we have used the um, we have used a lot or followed a lot of the same principles in terms of um, wanting our videos to be able to be used by educators. But what we have discovered um, through some of our tracking of Art Babel is that educators are having a hard time finding the videos to use them in the classroom. And so um, I think this points a little bit back to the problem of being able to extract information from a video the necessity of, you know, the text files of the transcriptions. But um, what we have, part of, part of the, the reason for talking about this is that we've tried to address this in the new Art Babel um, with the four educator section. And so attempting to, first of all, have videos be tagged for the structure of the site in a way that makes them findable for topics that teachers are using. Um, we found that a lot of teachers want to be able to grab our content and plug it directly exi into existing um, uh, lesson plans. And so we've uh, made the very first attempt uh, or uh, taken a first stab at creating this content online um, in easily digestible um, smaller groupings of videos in our four educator section. And these small lessons, we hope, will be able to be utilized by teachers. You know, you can go on, watch a couple of videos, look exactly for the term that you're looking for, and then plug it right into an existing lesson plan. Yeah, and I, I think that it's also a good thing to point out um, that R21 really came up with a fantastic idea a few years ago when they took their full episodes and pulled out extracts of 
specific sections that the artists were talking about so that if there was something applicable uh, for a lesson, a teacher is able to pull that one chunk out without necessarily having to um, have the entire episode, which may not be applicable or in some cases appropriate for the audience that they're working with. Great, great point, yes. Excellent. Let's see if I'm looking through some more of our, our comments we've queued up here. Might be interesting. Um, one of the things that people, someone asked was to, for Emily, um, how do you measure the art, the information about the art babble audience? Do you know more about them than, you, than we would say no from the audience on YouTube? Sure. So we actually did um, a full-blown survey as we were preparing to do the site redesign um, this past spring. And what we discovered about Art Babel um, for the old site is that we were almost 40% educators, um, and that of that, about 20% of those were having um, either restrictions or fully blocked YouTube in the classroom. And so um, that was about, I think it was about 8% of our audience. Um, and what we decided was that um, in order for the site to keep going, we needed to move ahead with using YouTube on Babble, but um, it's definitely something to point out. Uh, it's my feeling that with the new design of the site and the new way to access the videos, that um, our educator audience is going to grow. They'll be able to find the videos that they're looking for more easily and access the content um, faster, uh, as I was mentioning a moment ago, to be able to plug it in quicker. Um, instead of having the time to blog or to, to scroll through hours of videos. Great. Thank you for that. No problem. All righty. Let's see. Got a few more questions here. We can take a look at. And I'd also like to oh. just very quickly interject, uh, oh, sure. point out that um, we've launched an evaluation button on the screen. I know that some people may have to sign out a little bit early today. Uh, so if you are about to leave, please make sure to click on that yellow evaluation button, and that will launch a survey in your web browser. And we'd love to just get your feedback on today's session. Uh, thanks, but, uh, thanks, Adam, for mentioning that. You're welcome. Um, uh, one question that came up earlier in reference to David's comments about QR codes. Are there other scanning tools that you found, like um, Google Goggles or other apps that you found for mobile devices that allow people to connect to video content with their mobile devices in gallery? I would like to punt on that one. <laughs> uh, I think the, the yeah, that is the the big issue. The the best situation is to have a screen in the gallery if possible, and some of the smaller screens um, can play things off of a thumb drive and are relatively inexpensive for people to get access to. I, I mean, that's kind of the the dream scenario is that you then have something right next to what people are using. I, I mean, I always was a little jealous when I would go, I went to the Seattle Art Museum and they had an entire room devoted to the projection of an inner As far as other scanners, the Google Goggles is, uh, I think, gets into that rights issue if you have more contemporary work. Um, I think with uh, museums with more legacy content, it may recognize things a little bit better. Uh, I know that with the Acousta Guide wands that we use, there's, I think there's the possibility to do small clips of video. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is an ongoing um, problem that we have. As far as the in-museum experience, though, I think that the, the video content needs to be extremely brief, it needs to be extremely applicable, and it needs to really add to uh, the experience and not distract them from looking closely at what they're supposed to be looking at. And that's why I think in, when you see it in a lot of um, wands or devices, it's embedded, it tells you to look at the wand, it has you look at the you know 15 to 30 second clip and then tells you that the clip is done and keeps you moving from there. Great. Emily, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'll just bring up a couple of examples. Uh, I've seen some really beautiful stuff done uh, around the country. At um, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, they had um, small little screens on 
stands next to works of art that were showing the works of art in motion. And the one that I remember is a Nick Cave sound suit that they were showing as it was dancing. And I felt like that was a really beautiful and elegant way to display some video um, that would be useful in the space without having it sort of be, uh, you know, up, you know, distracting. Um, the other thing that I will just mention really quickly is that here at the IMA, we had a space where we could play video called the Davis Lab. Um, we have gone away from that as what we found is that instead of watching videos on the available computers in the space, um, people were using the couch <laughs> for, you know, taking a nap or, um, and using the computers to look at their Facebook. So I would uh, say that if you can limit the uh, sort of access that people can have on computers and keep it as focused as possible, you're going to get the um, you're going to get the best sort of feedback or best possible interaction from them. Yeah, and you're definitely starting to see more um, software that lets you use iPads and those types of uh, devices to be able to um, mount content a little bit easier, also. And that was the second example I was going to bring up. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the Art Institute and the beautiful um, installation of um, iPads that they just put into their Deck Arts Gallery, I highly recommend um, looking that project up. Yeah. I think there was a question about um, iTunes U that we did not... Um, yeah, that, that was the next thing I was going to mention to you guys, that we didn't touch on iTunes U as much, but um, it is still an option for people, correct? Yes. iTunes U is a great option. I mean, there is... Um, there is a little bit of difficulty, I think, for some museums to be able to get on board. They're not as um, welcoming as the Art Babel community is uh, to be able to make sure that you can get on to as a partner. Uh, their real concern is that you are publishing content on a regular basis and that your content is you know, rich and, and useful for that audience. But I think that usually if you can reach out to them, um, the nice thing about it is if you can get things set up on your end so that you're pushing... RSS feeds, instead of having to manually upload to iTunes U, it makes it extremely easy. So I know that within our video management system, I have a couple feeds set up, and I have the ability to just drop those into those feeds um, and assign them to that. And then iTunes U, the RSS, picks it up and has it available for it. And it is a great option for teachers and learners to be able to download content and watch it later. And I think that that's something that we probably have not addressed enough is there really is a push for people to be able to watch content when they want to watch it and not necessarily tied to uh, the device that you think that they are tied to. So if there are ways that you can make things available for people to be able to download, um, the more the better. And if you can make those things uh, published and make people aware that they exist, then I think that's a, a great way for people to be able to enjoy your content when they want to and to enjoy it a little bit longer so that they're not necessarily waiting for a network connection or interrupted by an email or a chat at the same time. Great. Okay. So I think it's almost time for us to wrap up. And so I wanted to ask a, a final question for, for David and Emily. Um, where do you see the future of video in museums? Do you see it as a place where we're going to be using it to kind of support art historical research or comment for educational use? Or will we see museums going in directions of actually being really innovative content creators themselves? Or both? Well, um, that's a great question. I don't think we can avoid the boom of um, content that's being created around the globe. You know, the, the vast content of YouTube videos, uh, I think, is just a hint at what people are capable of creating. And I think that um, museums are just beginning to really tap into what's possible there. And the slides David showed where people are creating content for MoMA, I think, is a really great example of how we can continue to engage with our audiences in the medium that they're using within their own lives. And I think that um, as we see this current generation of students begin to grow up, these students are learning with video in their classrooms. So um, as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the very beginning of museums really beginning to take advantage of the possibilities of video. Um, 
but it's my hope that uh, this can be an entry into the redefinition of museums as um, a central hall of learning, you know, as a centralized location for learning to happen. That's a great, that's a great statement, Emily. Dave, what are your thoughts? I think that what we're going to see is more artists producing their own content, so we will have that going for us, that they're going to come with things already in hand that are ready for us to be able to use. The important thing for me is that museums continue to be a part of the culture, that they continue to engage um, with the culture and the way that it makes sense and the way that people are doing it. I think if people, if museums are not producing content in these manners, um, it starts to get to this point where the canon that we have built up starts to disappear, that the relevance of it becomes lost, that people don't necessarily have that connection to it. Um, you'll see, I think, in the future, more people producing their own content, making their own responses, uh, making their own video about their trip to a museum, combining that material. I mean, we've seen one video that we had online multiple times. People have downloaded it, remixed it, and re-uploaded it to YouTube. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is kind of the uh, sweet spot, that people are interested in the content, that they're doing new things with it, that they're using it as part of the culture and building upon it. Um, I think the other thing that's very exciting is going back to what you were initially saying, is that it, it really is a resource, and it is something that can have a longer uh, set of life for the um, institution. And a lot of times we have special exhibitions that come and go in six months, and they, we have videos that now people are watching that are three or four years old that still let people have some experience of the exhibition, though it's never going to replicate the full experience of being directly in front of something. It gives them a chance to really engage and make it a meaningful part of their life in some way. Excellent. Thank you, David. That was a great uh, summary comment. I agree as well that video has a huge role to play in the future of museums and welcoming crowdsourced contribution into the institution, whether it's video or images or tags or text, is something that we'll see um, in a more expansive way in the future. So if we can start planning for that now with our infrastructure, with our policy as well, I think we'll be in a better place for the future, and uh, we need your help to uh, to expand that vision horizon. So uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, Adam, is there anything else we need to do before wrapping up the session? No, I, I think we're in some good shape now. I, I'd like to just give everyone a quick reminder about the evaluation button that's on the screen. So definitely as we wrap up, please uh, take a moment to uh, click on that so that you can launch the survey in your browser. Um, we do have a final question that we'll leave you with in the chat box, uh, which I am typing in right now. Uh, what topics do you want to see discussed at future MCN Pro workshops? And you can type those in, and we'll have a, a record of your feedback as we wrap up today. But I'll turn the floor back over to our panel if you'd like to say any final words. Thank you all for being here. This is a great first launch for MCN Pro, and we hope you'll sign up for the rest of the series with learning times. And uh, also contact us on social media and uh, consider joining the Museum Computer Network. Great. Thank you so much. I'd, I'd just like to say a uh, last thing. Um, for those participants who are curious about follow-up resources and details, you can always go back and check out the mcnpro.org website where you registered for this webinar, and we'll continue to post resources there as well and give some direction on how to access recordings and other pieces. So uh, feel free to check there, and thank you so much for joining us.